This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. One of the central problems of humankind has always been vain egotism. An intense psychological urge in many is the desire to bolster their self-esteem at the expense of others. History records that Elizabeth, Empress of Russia, was so fond of the color pink that she made it a crime for any other woman in her empire to wear it. The New York Telephone Company made a survey to discover what word was used more than any other. They found that the personal pronoun, I, was the most often used word, used on an average of eight times in each telephone conversation. The most used letter, the most frequently worn out on a typewriter, is the letter I. And yet, 2,000 years ago, there lived a man who taught, the greatest among you shall be the servant of all, and he who loses himself in great purposes shall find himself. Upon the assassination of a famous social reformer, one national political leader declared only the cleansing of society will bring the cleansing of our souls. And yet might not one perceive it in another way, that only the cleansing of our souls can ultimately bring the cleansing of society and of the world itself, that only an inward transformation of man himself can truly transform man's world. Some will say, well, the brotherhood of man is only a dream. So once was the satellite, polio vaccine, the airplane, radio, telephone. So once were transistors, computers, artificial kidneys, heart transplants, and walking on the moon. All dreams. Until men and women decided to make them each come true. So it can be with brotherhood. This holiest hope of all of humankind for peace, for love, for understanding. If we will work and live, that it may come to pass. But it must begin within the human soul, within your soul. How then to improve this problematic planet? Can one sickness cure another? Is smallpox cured by scarlet fever? Is diphtheria the remedy for pneumonia? Will a case of the measles cure a case of the mumps? Neither is the cure for violence simply more violence or another kind of violence. One sickness cannot cure another. Hatred is not healed by vengeance. Animosity never alleviated by reprisal, nor wrong righted by revenge. Sickness is not healed by sickness, nor hatred by hatred, nor evil by evil. Only love, only compassion, only a committed concern for our fellow global villagers on this earth can bring ultimately peace on earth and goodwill among men the brotherhood of man beneath the fatherhood of God. And yet, when tempted to despair about the world, bear well in mind that ours is a planet in process, a world incomplete as yet, that we are in the midst of a long and sometimes painful growing time. Our civilization is in its troubled adolescence now. We are passing into that awkward and ungainly stage of growth wherein the lures of maturity and the egocentricity of childishness beckon to society from both directions and without an understanding of our world's present incompleteness we cannot hope to comprehend all that is befalling our world and the hope which furthermore lies beyond it but tragically there have been times in our generation when violence the way of death seemed to be becoming a way of life there is an evil, futile, and false philosophy in the world that wrong is made right by the shedding of blood, that justice is gained by unjust means, that righteous causes are advanced by ways not righteous in themselves, that somehow good is to be achieved even by evil acts. This has not ever been, nor shall it ever be. For if the way of death becomes a way of life, then those who refuse to live together will be doomed to die together. Legislation can change man's laws. Education can change man's thinking. Philosophy can change man's understanding. Politics and economics can change man's government. And science and technology can change man's world. But only love can change man's heart. And only living faith in the living God can change man's inner soul and bring about the brotherhood of man beneath the sovereign fatherhood of God upon this sometimes hating, hurting world. And the time to begin it is now. And the one to begin it is you. Living in love 
for God and for others, which were Jesus of Nazareth's two great commandments nearly 2,000 years ago. The first of those commandments was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And yet how curious, extraordinary, now, perhaps disquietingly untheological, Jesus listed the mind as only one of four ways in which human beings ought to love God, and he listed it third. Augustine once defined theology as a matter of faith seeking understanding, but for many contemporary theologians it has become, sadly, understanding seeking faith. Much contemporary religious scholarship consists of a theology in search of a gospel, a good news, a creed in quest of an experience. Yet the religion of Jesus is different. It is experiential. It abounds with power and with joy. It is possible to know some things for certain. And this is the business of religion, the quest of it, the discovery and the experiencing of spiritual truths. Foremost among these, being the love of God and the love of others, knowing that you belong in this universe, that God has a plan for this planet and a will for your life. If you set out to describe this God of the universe in one sentence, you would best end that sentence not with a period, but with a comma. God is beyond our ways. God has no beginning, no end. The very attempt to conceive of God will stretch your mind beyond its limits. You end the sentence about God with a comma, for there is always more to be said, more to be known, more to be experienced. But this you can know in this moment, now, that God loves you and has an eternal will for your eternal life right here and now, if you will choose to live it in the conviction that you are in a universe of love, that the kingdom of God is within you, something of God's pulsing presence, his real spirit indwells your mind to lead and guide your decision-making. If you quest for perfection and live loyally to truth, beauty, and goodness, aspiring truly to live as the son or daughter of God you really are, and you were born and created to be, and in this is life, in this is zest, joy, meaning, purpose, and value. All of life then becomes marvelously enriched. One of God's most wondrous gifts to humankind is memory. For instance, this very moment I can recall in my hometown back in Kansas, years ago, those nippy Saturday afternoons in autumn, each window pane laced with the fine embroidery of frost the incomparable incense of raked leaves burning on every street corner, old men puffing black briar pipes and tending the crackling fires, boys throwing a football in the street at dusk before dinner time, the stark silhouette of barren trees against the icy silver sunset of a cold, still Kansas afternoon. All this, all this is mine in memory forever. Have you pondered in awe this wondrous human faculty. Memory, by recollection, you can bring to mind the beauties, the delights of days you lived before in other times, other places. God gave memory, and this is only one example that we might preserve in our thoughts the truths, the goodnesses, the beauties, the meanings and the values of our past experience, and yet many human beings will use this glorious gift of God to us, this gift of memory, only to recall the errors, the pains, the failings, the griefs, the woe-begone burdens of living. Turn, rather, with faith to God and give yourself heart, mind, soul, and strength to God's purposes for you. Give mind and memory, thought and experience, your very being, every nerve and sinew of you to God and pray that greatest prayer of all, your will be done, and something enormously transformative from the very heartbeat of the universe surrounds and fills and stirs your soul to new aspirations, to becoming 
what you were born and created to be. In this finding of God, you find real joy. In living this new life of a son or daughter of the living God by faith, you discover a profound spiritual satisfaction. One psychologist of my acquaintance has said that some people never experience in all of their entire lifetimes one day of authentic happiness from morning to night, from waking to sleeping again. Yet the highest levels of joy are spiritual in nature. This is both my conviction and it is my experience. You can never personally discover the pleasure of swimming until you get into the water. Neither will you ever personally know and enjoy the happiness of faith until you plunge in and begin living your life day by day, moment by moment, in faith in God. The only way personally, totally, to experience the thrill of snow skiing or surfboarding is by snow skiing or surfboarding. And the only way you'll ever find the really highest joy of human life is by trusting faith in the living God, by giving your life to the God who gave you your life in the first place, the universal Father, the Father of the universal family of God, galaxy to galaxy. This is a friendly cosmos. And you are befriended this moment. Believe it or not, only dare to believe it. You are befriended by God and are a member infinitely beloved in God's great family of love. And then write to us, will you? We really want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, any and all of this literature, yours free, without cost, charge, or obligation when you write to us. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell out mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.